Thank you, everybody, for listening to me today. I'm honored to be here and to share a little story with you guys that I hope you can help me create a big story out of. Uh, this story starts in 2000. I was 20 years old, and I was about to undertake the most exciting project in my life. And this was a project to the Galapagos Islands. I was a wildlife photographer, as Nissa said, and I'd uh, photographed in probably you know, five or 10 countries so far. But ever since I was a kid, I loved sharks. Sharks were the coolest animals on the planet. They were the last dragons, the last dinosaurs that we have. And they were feared, they were enigmatic, and all I wanted to do was photograph these suckers. So I cooked up an assignment to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. So I took a photo assignment to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. And uh, as I said, sharks were my passion. And I learned very early on. I met my first shark when I was nine years old. And instead of coming up and eating me, this shark was actually afraid of me. And this changed my perspective dramatically. What it did was for a kid that loved the oceans so much, it freed me from this fear of the oceans and opened it up for exploration. I no longer had to be afraid. I could go and see and interact and learn what the oceans were all about. I became a wildlife photographer, took a photo assignment to the Galapagos Islands, Ecuador. The Galapagos Islands are 900 miles off the coast of Ecuador, in the middle of the Pacific. It's one of the biggest marine reserves on the planet, one of the most protected places on Earth. And I was there to photograph hammerhead sharks. It's one of the only places in the world where hammerhead sharks congregate in schools. There's hundreds of them here. And when I arrived in the Galapagos, instead of finding sharks and all their majesty underwater, what I found was 100 kilometers of illegally set fishing lines. This is a line with 16,000 baited hooks that would stretch from Earth to outer space. And they were fishing for sharks, fishing for the animals that I'd loved ever since I was a kid. Now, sharks have been here for 450 million years. 150 million years before there were dinosaurs, there were sharks in the oceans shaping ecosystems. They're the first vertebrate on Earth with jaws. Now, you can imagine the impact of these animals. If you have a fish tank full of sharks and you want to put any new animal into that fish tank, it's going to have to be shark tested, just like our oceans have been. The oceans have been shaped by sharks. The oceans give us more than 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. Long line fishing. The reason why they were fishing for sharks is because of the massive demand for shark fin soup in Asia. Every year we kill 100 million sharks. Shark populations have dropped 90% in 30 years. And the reason why this is happening is for shark fin soup. And people started finning, where they'd pull the sharks out of the water, cut off just the fins, and throw the rest of the body back. This wastes 95% of the animal. It's incredibly wasteful. And when I started making shark water, it was discouraged or illegal in about six countries. Now it's illegal in about 85 countries. So some serious progress has been made. But the greatest amount of sharks caught on a historical record were caught last year after we already knew their populations had dropped 90%. So there's a big consumer awareness issue, and there's still a huge demand for it. So this needs to be curbed. So I spent the next year trying to get the word out there that sharks were being wiped out using photo stories and magazine articles. We set up a fund in the Galapagos so anyone reading these articles could donate to putting a patrol boat in the Galapagos. And after a year and all the effort I could possibly put into it, we got about $1,300 in donations, which was very, very little compared to the amount of effort we put in. So I figured, what could I do to change this? I realized people didn't care about sharks because everyone was afraid of them. You know, people wanted to care about pandas and elephants and bears, but nobody wanted to care for sharks because they were afraid of them. And if we lost all the sharks, the world would be safer, theoretically. So I figured if I could make a movie, then maybe I could give people my impression of sharks and make them see sharks through my eyes, let them see sharks as beautiful and magnificent and amazing and important, and then maybe they'd want to fight for their protection. So I decided, what if I made a movie? I had no film experience whatsoever, but I think part of that you know, naivety helped me in the process. So I went to all my photo editors, and I lied, and I said I was going to do my next photo assignment with digital cameras. And I took all the money and borrowed a bunch of money and rented the biggest motion picture cameras I could. My girlfriend at the time bought me two books on how to make movies, which I read on the plane on the way there. And I had two movies on my laptop computer, Snatch and Amelie. And that was my entire film career in history. And I went out on Paul Watson's ship, 
from Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He's the guy that's ramming Japanese whaling boats in Antarctica. I jumped on his boat and started a journey towards Costa Rica to try to make a pretty underwater movie about sharks. Now, three weeks into the movie, We'd rammed a pirate fishing boat. We got charged with attempted murder. The Taiwanese mafia was behind it, and we were running from Costa Rica while the Coast Guard was chasing us with machine guns. And it became a very, very different movie than, uh, than the one I set out to make. And we've got a little uh, trailer here to show you. and you see the thing that you were taught your whole life to fear, and it doesn't want to hurt you, and it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And your whole world changes. The one animal that we fear the most is the one we can't live without. Nature created them for a reason. Now human beings just, they don't care. There's no campaign like a Greenpeace campaign to save the sharks. They scourge you the ocean. And maybe once you go and catch one. Future generations are going to think of us as barbarians. I needed to know why people were killing sharks and what I could do to stop it. So I embarked on a journey that would change my life forever. So, shark water was a bit of a crapshoot from the get-go. When I came back from the first initial filming, when everything went disastrously wrong, I came back massively in debt. I had uh, flesh-eating disease while we were shooting the movie, but upon arrival back home, I had dengue fever, West Nile virus, and tuberculosis all at the same time. And I'd never made a movie before. You know, I had no idea what I was doing, really. I didn't, know any, I didn't have any friends that made movies, so I was charged with what am I gonna do to get this film off the ground? And as Nissa said, it ended up taking five years, 15 countries, nearly killing me. And it wasn't without the friends and family that made me pull it through. Thanks to EcoVision, we finally had our premiere in Asia, which was in Hong Kong here. And uh, the main market for this movie is China. And we haven't actually got the film out there yet. But at the premiere in Hong Kong, I was so excited because it's the gateway to China. And in China, 75% of consumers don't know shark fin soup has shark in it, apparently because the translation is fish wing soup. So at the premiere, I'm really excited, thinking we're gonna do something to save sharks. We put all this effort into this film, and someone puts up their hand in the audience and says, what's the point of stopping us from eating shark fin if all the fish are gonna be gone by 2048 anyways? All the fish are gonna be gone by 2048 anyways, according to the United Nations. We are so overfishing the oceans that they're almost gone. 90% of not just sharks, but all large fish are gone already. Every year, we waste 54 billion pounds of fish. Fish that are brought into the ocean, killed, and thrown back because they weren't our target species, while 8 million people die of starvation. It's atrocious. And it happens all the time because it's happening out there and you guys can't see it. Most of the oceans aren't owned by anybody. Only 1% of the oceans are actually protected. To figure out what was going on and why all the fish were being wiped out, I went to Australia. Australia has the Great Barrier Reef, and it's one of the biggest national parks in the world. And if there's anywhere where there should be a healthy fish population, it should be Australia. In Australia, 
I uncovered something. I didn't actually uncover it, actually. I just, just found out for myself. But what I found out was not only are most of the fish gone from Australia, but all the carbon we've put into the atmosphere, most of it gets absorbed by the oceans, creating carbonic acid. This carbonic acid makes the surface of the ocean more acidic, dissolving the skeletons of coral, things like phytoplankton and zooplankton. 50 to 70% of the oxygen in the, in the air that we breathe comes from this life in the oceans. Coral reefs are the main protein source for one billion people in Asia. 60% of the world's fisheries are dependent upon coral reefs. One million species, 25% of all recorded species in the oceans live on coral reefs. And scientists think coral reefs are gonna be gone this century. At our current concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere, we're at about 390 parts per million. Over 350 parts per million, coral reefs and the shells of things like phytoplankton are dissolving. This is a massive, massive problem, massive problem. So I tried to figure out what on earth could I do about this? How could we stop, you know, my main goal was trying to protect sharks, but we couldn't protect sharks if we're gonna lose all the coral reefs, you know, the most important ecosystems for our oceans. To combat this, we needed to combat carbon emissions. The biggest carbon emissions in the world come from coal-fired power plants, of which one is being built every 10 days in China. To battle coal-fired power plants, I got an invitation to Washington, D.C. to take part in something called Power Shift. Now, Power Shift was to try to send a message to the United States government that youth wanted more climate protection and they wanted it at the UN climate change conference that was happening in Copenhagen. So 10,000 youth gathered in front of the White House to try to send a message. They went in and saw their representatives And 5,000 of America's activists gathered to shut down a coal power, the coal-fired power plant that was powering the nation's capital. This is one of the biggest environmental rallies and protests in America's history. A massive event. Everyone thought, yes, this is going to be great. We're going to achieve some sort of protection. Copenhagen's going to be a big win. Theoretically, they shut down the coal power plant for the day because no one could bring in any coal. But no less coal was burned that day than the day prior and not a lot of press was created out of the event. So despite being a big positive for the conservation community, to me, it really didn't do anything to protect the oceans, it didn't do anything to protect sharks or to stop the oceans from being acidified. The second biggest carbon emitter in the world is deforestation. It counts for about 30% of carbon emissions. And I got an invitation to go to an environmental film festival in Brazil called the Amazonas Film Festival. And in Brazil, I discovered something even more horrific. All of the world's rainforests are expected to be gone by 2060. So around the middle of this century, we're not just facing the loss of sharks, the loss of fish, we're the loss of rainforests, and the loss of reefs. These are our life support systems that we're degrading. In the very same time, within our lifetimes, we're causing the extinction of more species than have gone extinct in the last 65 million years. The sixth extinction is being caused by us humans, and we're gonna be a part of it unless we change dramatically. Next, I went to Copenhagen for the UN Climate Change Conference. This was the big hope for all environmentalists, thinking that if there was gonna be some protection for the environment, it would come out of this conference. At the conference, not only did nothing beneficial happen, a few countries went into the conference and changed the game so dramatically as to render the whole process impotent. One of those countries was my home country, Canada. I went back to Canada and started asking why. What on earth could make Canada do this? Canada signed the Kyoto Protocol, which called for a cut in emissions, which actually made that cut in emissions civil law within Canada. But not only did Canada not cut emissions, they increased emissions dramatically. I went back to Canada and started asking questions. Why? What could turn Canada into a criminal within its borders? And I found the answer in the Alberta tar sands. The biggest, most destructive project on the planet. It will eventually have destroyed an area approximately the size of Florida but created enough oil to power worldwide demand for about eight years. Seemingly inconsequential in the face of the damage that it's doing. But the big realization for me was that the Canadian government was making a lot of money off of this, and that's why they were breaking the law. And this is the biggest fundamental problem and the biggest change that's happened to me in terms of turning me from a shark conservationist into whatever I'm trying to do right now. The problem, fundamental as I see it, is there is a 
direct link between corporations and the government, and that is the biggest problem we're facing. 51 out of the biggest 100 economies in the world are businesses. During the second half of the 20th century, world economies grew sevenfold while our population doubled. This is an enormous problem, and this is causing environmental degradation all over the world. 125,000 Indians committed suicide in 2008 because of crop failures. About a billion people around the world are malnourished. About a billion people around the world don't have access to safe drinking water. And we're losing all of the ecosystems we depend on for survival this century. How many people can our planet sustain? If we all lived like we do, we'd need six planet Earths to sustain life. Across the board, scientists estimate we have about two billion people too many on this planet. Massive, massive problem. We've, throughout the last hundred years, had a fair bit of war, quite a bit of war, and we've had those wars when we've had theoretically unlimited resources and unlimited space. And now that we're running into very real problems with limited resources and limited space, the fighting is estimated to grow. So in the face of this, I started asking questions. What, what on earth could I do? How, how am I going to get out of this? And I started thinking about escape plans. And I heard that George Bush had a 99,000 acre ranch in Paraguay with an airstrip where he could escape to when all hell breaks loose. So I started thinking, OK, well, maybe I could find a little plot of land somewhere and grow some vegetables and bring my family or whatever. And I quickly realized that you know, whatever I brought, all of my stuff in this little retreat wasn't really my stuff at all. And that people under stress and people under pressure will resort to any means necessary. We're in this together. If I have stuff, I have food, I have shelter, and other people don't, they're going to come and take my stuff. Same thing with Canada. Canada has a lot of natural resources and a lot of natural wealth. But if Canada doesn't cough it up, other countries are going to come and take it. China owns 60% of the biggest oil company in the tar sands. If Canada stops, they're going to come and take it. So nothing is ours. It is shared. We are in this together. We can't save anybody unless we save everybody. The good news. We've had revolutions in the past. We've had revolutions that have separated church and state. And now, in a similar way, we need revolutions again. Around the world, there's more than a million non-governmental organizations. A million non-governmental organizations that are fighting for good. They're fighting for the survival of humanity. Conservation's changed. It's not hugging trees and saving pandas anymore. It's save the humans. This is the biggest issue we've ever faced. If you look at it, all the numbers, you know, the scientists, the economists, they're pretty unanimous on this. We have exponential growth within a finite system. We have massive, our population doubles every 50 years, but we have one planet. We can't create more of it. We're not going to outer space. We need to learn to survive on this planet. And to do that, we need radical change. The change can't come from buying Toyota Priuses and simply from recycling. The change needs to be bigger than that. We are too far down the line, and we're too far in the wrong direction. We can't talk about overfishing without talking about overpopulation. We can't talk about climate change without talking about the oceans. We can't be addressing these problems singularly. We need to be addressing the problems across the board. When we're talking about climate change and other environmental issues, we are very much putting a Band-Aid on the symptom of the problem. Climate change isn't the problem itself. It is a symptom of a much larger problem, the larger problem being too many people consuming too much and destroying the world we depend on for survival. Life depends on life, right? Plants create the air that we breathe. Bacteria break organic matter down. But what we're doing is systematically taking that life, converting it into products, and then converting it into waste. This can't continue. We need change. We need change in a massive way. But I do not know what the future is going to look like. If it was simply overfishing, I could say we need to stop overfishing. But it's not. It's a bigger problem. It's a bigger issue. And we need bigger change than that. And I think because of that, this is a moral decision. What is the future going to look like? 2050, are we going to be eating each other? Or will we have figured it out? And I think because it's a moral issue now, it's an issue that humanity needs to decide on. It can't be an issue decided by Obama. It can't be an issue decided by Wall Street or by the United Nations. It needs to be an issue decided by humanity. And for that reason, I think everyone needs to be educated. People need to know what we're facing. What is this century going to look like? What is the world going to look like for our kids? And from that perspective, we can plot a pathway forward. But if people don't know where we're at, if people don't know what we're up against, we're going to be continuing 
continuing in the same cycle that we're in. And wham, we're going to be there in a civilization about to collapse. We are the first, first civilization that can really look back on past civilizations and say, wow, I know why that civilization collapsed. Most civilizations that have ever existed have collapsed. And recent findings have shown that most of them have collapsed because they've destroyed the world around them. Easter Islanders ended up eating each other. The Romans fell, the Mayans fell. We have an opportunity here to know and to look and to see that we have so overexploited our planet that is now our civilization that's about to collapse. The good news, revolutions are possible when people are educated. What were the ingredients in revolutions of the past? There was a mass atrocity. A mass atrocity because of slavery. A mass atrocity that women didn't have rights. A mass atrocity that there was whaling or holes in the ozone layer. And now it is an enormous atrocity that we waste 54 billion pounds of fish every year while 8 million people die of starvation. That pretty well all of our natural resources are going to be gone by the middle of the century and that our very life support systems are so degraded. This is a massive atrocity. And if people knew about this, they would take a stand on it. Somewhere along the way, unbeknownst to us and unbeknownst to humanity, economic health and the, growth of civil and the growth of business has taken priority over the health of people, the health of our civilization. And we need to turn that around. It is not the most important thing that the economy grows. We do not need perpetual growth. We do not need businesses to be healthy above all else. And I think if we as a public can see that and we can take a stand on it, we can have a revolution like we've had in the past, but bigger, bigger than a revolution. And for that reason, I think everybody needs to be educated. Thank you.